Welcome to Psychology 101, Week 9. So today we're going to be talking about intelligence, and uh, intelligence is something I you know, like to ponder on sometimes, and I joke with my son just to keep him humble, but usually I say things like, who's to say a human is smarter than a cockroach, for example? Cockroaches have been along, around on this planet a lot longer than a human has, so who's really smarter, the cockroaches or the humans? Because you know what? The cockroaches will probably outlive the humans. So again, what is intelligence? Is it your ability for your species to survive for long periods of time? Uh, is it just based upon how quickly that the mind works, uh, such as speed or response time? Is it knowledge, how much you know? Is it you know skills? Is it your ability to take a test, for example? So again, intelligence and the definition of intelligence and what we've Mind is intelligent is kind of like the saying it's in the eyes of the beholder you know really we're looking at when we look at intelligence or specific aspects of things you know like musical ability or ability to do math or reasoning or verbal or spatial skills for example okay so that's the goal of psychology is to really operationally define what we're studying in intelligence just something specific that we can actually measure okay So, many psychologists believe in this thing called the G factor. And the G factor is just like an underlying, all encompassing theory of intelligence, right? So, it's talking about mental speed, working memory, uh, how much information you can process, you know, your ability to take tests, your ability to engage in skills, spatial factors. So basically put everything I just put said together and call it the G factor, this idea of general intelligence, this underlying intelligence, okay? So the idea of the G factor is that we all have these different abilities and these abilities then compound with other abilities. So put all of your abilities together, all of your skills, all of your knowledge, all of your you know, thinking and your approach to life and the way you view things and your perception and put that all together. And that's the idea of G, this idea of general intelligence, which again is very hard to measure with something like a pen and paper test, for example, because some people are just not interested in school, but then all of a sudden you see them play guitar and you're like, okay, that person is a genius, you know, for example. So we have fluid intelligence, and this is the idea of the power of reasoning, using information, and solving new problems. So again, think of something like the first time you go to learn something, and your ability to actually focus on that problem, try to figure it out, that's fluid intelligence. Then there's crystallized intelligence, which is take all of the skills that you learned for a long time, those acquired skills, those things you had to work to learn, that's your crystallized knowledge, okay? So, and there's a big disparity with age here because it turns out, you know, younger people generally do a little bit better when it comes to fluid intelligence, such as studying something new. But then somebody of the older generation much, has maybe much more skill in crystallized intelligence, but we're studying something that's specific, something that takes knowledge and many years to acquire, for example. Such as, like, does a new doctor have as much crystallized intelligence? as a doctor that might be older and have been practicing for 30 years. You know, again, this is the idea of acquiring skills. So you have this idea of who has the capacity to learn the most, fluid intelligence, and then who has learned the most, crystallized intelligence. The tests are IQs. And again, when it comes to IQ testing, there are many biases, and the book goes over tons of them, such as culture, race, sex, social class, uh, healthcare issues, uh, the biggest thing that you should take when it comes to IQ tests and intelligence is the number one factor associated with how well you do on the test is health in general, uh, disease, you know, exposure, and then the social context, things like poverty, uh, educational attainment, uh, where did you go to school, what kind of neighborhood was it, what are the property taxes like, did you experience abuse as a child? Um, these, you know, some of the negative social context factors have a big influence when it comes to overarching intelligence, you know, because again, you know, if you grow up in an area that doesn't really appreciate education, isn't striving for education, then how much crystallized knowledge are you really acquiring, okay? So the other factor then is genetics and biology, okay? So 
biology and genetics plays a large factor in our activation, our gene activation, our capacity to learn, okay? And again, we are all limited by our biology and what a human can actually learn. So aptitude is your ability to learn. An achievement is what you actually have learned, okay? So most people are born with this blank, blank slate of aptitude, unless you have some kind of disability, for example. But most of us are kind of within that bell curve of the IQ. Uh, so all of us have the same ability to learn, but that ability to learn is then affected by the social environment and health and things like that, okay? Um, and so the IQ test is then called an intelligence quotient. And basically it's a compounding of many different skill sets and your ability to do well on those skill sets that hopefully balances out for culture. And then that measures your IQ based upon your age and where you should be with regarding to development, okay? So we have a bunch of different tests. We've got the Alfred Binet test, the Stanford Binet. Uh, we got the Wexler test, okay? These are the most popular in modern times. Um, so the book does a good job of going over the Stanford Binet test. Look at that. It's got some great examples of test questions that it might ask. And what it does is it has specific questions for specific ages, you know? So if like a, a four-year-old can answer a specific question that's meant for a six-year-old, and it, then, then that means that they are, you know, getting toward that IQ of having an IQ level of a six-year-old, for example. Uh, so this, that's how the Stanford Binet test measures. It uh, compares your age to the types of questions that you're answering, and then it determines kind of at what age questions are you capable of answering. Okay, so this is the idea of the Stanford Binet. Then the Wexler test is very similar to the Stanford Binet. Uh, this one has a separate test for under six or 16 and under, and then 16 and over. And then all of uh, both the Stanford Binet and the Wexler, it gives you just a variety of different scores. Overall IQ, verbal IQ, performance IQ, for example. So the book does a really good job of looking through the different types of tests and showing you what are on there. But again, these are arbitrary measures of, I, of intelligence. And to do well in a lot of these tests often requires an education, verbal skills, math skills, the ability to reason, things that are influenced by the social context, such as where you went to school, for example, and the type of teacher that you might have had, okay? So again, this idea of culture-reduced testing is incorporating all of these biases, uh, you know, because one test in one country when applied to a different country, it might not apply, it might not be accurately measuring, it might not be fairly measuring intelligence, it might have not have questions that are related to that country or that culture. So we need something that's a lot more cultural specific. So then the goal of the testing and removing bias over time has been to remove as many of these culturally biased questions as we can, okay? This next screen talks about the genetic differences and similarities. So as you guys can see, Twins that are reared together, um, very high correlations with IQ scores. Even twins that were reared apart have very similar uh, IQ scores. So you can see that biology and genetics has an incredible influence on IQ scores, and the social environment has some. But, you know, again, what's the most important factor when it comes to, you know, is it genetics? Is it health? Is it, you know, the social context? So again, all of these factors, but you can see that genetics does have an incredibly large influence, okay? So um, there are very genetic variations that have been correlated with intelligence. However, there's not like some gene that's just like the intelligence gene that some people have it and some people don't. Like, you know, it'd be hard to like show where in Einstein's brain that he has some gene or, you know, get into his DNA and find out where his gene is that's associated with intelligence. Because again, it's all these different forms of intelligence compound with your biology and the social context and the way you think about it, the psychology of it all, the cognitive factors, okay? Uh, so again, epigenetics is the influence of the social context on your gene expression. So again, your genes are then interacting with the social context. The social context is then influencing gene expression, which then influences your behavior, the way you think, the way you approach everything. So again, it's all a very biopsychosocial interrelated process. Okay, so again, this is the idea of the environmental factors. Um, so there's a lot to it. 
So a lot of people are scared, as the book talked about, of this idea of, oh no, a standardized test. The goal of a standardized test is to make it so it's as applicable and generalizable to a larger population. It's not something you should be scared of. It just, that's a test that someone in California, someone in Illinois, someone in New York, someone in Florida, someone in Canada, should all be able to take a test and it should be relevant reliable and valid for no matter which culture, which country you're in. So that's the idea of the standardization of tests, okay? Um, so the norms, again, when you look at the bell curve that's in the book, it shows the bell curve, and then it gives you the standard deviations away from the bell curve, and then which you know percentage of the population falls within the bell curve. And then it talks about the norms based upon age, and so there's a lot to it. Please make sure you guys look at that in the book. Uh, the distribution of IQ scores, again, is based upon this overall mean, your average of 100, but then most people fall within one, you know, one to two standard deviations, which in 15 to 30 points of the mean, okay? So that's the idea of the bell curve. The Flynn effect is that as IQ tests have been developed over the years, each generation tends to score a little bit higher on that. And that's not to say that one generation is smarter than the other. It's just that the knowledge that's being taught on the test then gets, you know, gets sent out a little bit more. And so people are more prepared to take the test. And so when they go to ask these questions the next time, you know, this is information that's kind of almost automatic onto something new, give us some of the new information. So every 10 years, they tend to increase how hard the IQ tests are to compensate for this idea of the Flynn, the Flynn effect, that you know every couple of years, that next generation starts to do a little bit better than the last one on the IQ tests. So reliability, again, that's the idea of somebody can take the test you know, a bunch of different times and still get the same exact score, okay? And then uh, t test, retest reliability, that's the idea of that. Like one person takes it and then go take it six months and they should be able to get a similar score. That shows that the test is reliably measuring things, but it doesn't necessarily say it's valid. For something to be valid, you have to make sure it's actually measuring what it is measuring. So again, I think about reliability as consistency. Is it consistent from time and time again? And then validity is accuracy. Is it accurate? Does the content and the responses and the structure and the variables, are they actually measuring what we want to measure, which is someone's IQ, okay? So again, interpreting fluctuations in scores, when tests are not perfectly reliable, scores fluctuate, you know? So somebody should be able to take it the same time and get the same score each time. If they tend to be missing it and things are, you know, kind of getting everywhere, then you're not going to get a general uh, idea of someone's intelligence. You're going to get very mixed results. You need something that's consistent over time, okay? Okay, so again, our IQ test bias, again, to be able to take an IQ test requires certain ability to reason and use math and language and, you know, certain skills. And based upon how you were socialized, do you have the skills that are required for that specific test is an overarching question. And then how do we reduce, reduce cultural bias whenever possible, okay? So the book does a great job of talking about the stereotype threat. And this is something I've learned about early in psychology is this idea that like, if you tell a woman before a test, men do better than women, don't worry if you don't get a good grade, then they tend to do worse on the test. But if you tell a woman you know, ahead of time, hey, stereotype threats exist. This idea that a woman does better on a, a not as well as a man is total crap. So you go out and rock that, who cares about that? Then they tend to do just fine. So again, we're all influenced by these stereotypes based upon race and age and sex and gender and religion. And, you know, stereotypes affect us in multidimensional ways. The effect of stigma has incredible negative psychological consequences. But one of the effects of stigmatization of stereotypes is the effect on testing itself. OK, so again, this is why it's very important to encourage all students, you know, and always be positive and never discourage them for any sociocultural factors. Okay, thank you so much. If you guys have any questions, please let me know and have a wonderful week.